My name is Sally Moss. I'm a trustee of Oril Murdin, um, and it's very appropriate that I'm meeting with Peter Boddenham here today because we're sitting in what was the original Carmarthen School of Art building, a place with a wonderful history. But as it happens, which is great, the very first time I met Peter was when he was a mere boy of 16. <laughs> he, he reminded me of this just the other day. Um, and he was a student himself at Carmarthen School of Art. So we met when he was a student, he came to do the pre-foundation course at Carmarthen School of Art, and I at the time was assistant curator of Carmarthen Museum, and the college asked me if I'd go and just do a couple of evenings, I think it was, to teach drawing, because I myself had been to art school, which I did, and that was when I, that was when I met Peter. And I mention this for two reasons, um, because obviously we're here to hear about Peter, not to hear about me, uh, but the two reasons are really is, Firstly, it reminded me when I met him and spoke to him recently of what he was like when he was a student at Carmarthen School of Art. And in a way, going through his CV and looking at the exhibition here, he's in a sense is exactly the same as he was then. And what he was like then was, apart from being very hard working and he had loved drawing, he was always drawing, but he was one of those very unusual young artists, in my view, who was absolutely engaged with discovery, but it was discovery of, and doing, you know, the fact that you do it. You can't discover much if you don't actually, actually do it. So that, I think, you, you'll see as we go along and he talks about his work. The second thread for me really was, um, was the fact that I'm a museum, I've worked in museums for most of my career. I'm obviously a very nosy person by nature, but also when you work in a museum, you're very keen to find out about the provenance of objects and the stories that every object has. And I realised when I was thinking about Peter and when he was 16 and the intervening years is that I wanted to know a bit about his provenance. I wanted to know a bit more about his story of how he's got to, he he got to here, where he is now. So over to you. You're, you're, you, can go, you, can be, you can become younger than 16. <laughs> Tell us how you came to be in Wales and then we'll go through the story. Well, I grew up on um, a small holding in... In Car uh, just outside Cardigan, um, and then I came to, it was called Dudley College of Art, then yes. I think it was, it's had many sort of name changes, but it's the same sort of thing as Command School of Art, so that was the beginning of my, uh, it was either farming or it was going to be sort of art design, um, so um, I came to sort of um, the art college and that was the start of my art, art career. Um, I went to Cardigan's at the school, uh, and then from, from there I went to Camberwell School of Art in London, and had a great time there, had a great time in Command, and had a great time there, so my art education was hugely enjoyable really, I was very lucky the, the lecturers I had. Um, and then from, from sort of there I, uh, I actually moved back to West Wales and I set up my workshop and luckily there's a gallery in London which took, took my work then. Um, and it's predominantly uh, ceramic based, predominantly more sculptural sort of, uh, although I'd, I'd sort of worked in pot pottery in Narbeth and um, very involved with the vessel and, and, and making um, functional things, but at that point it was very much sculptural. Um, then from, from there I uh, went, I think after about Ten years, maybe five, ten years. I can't remember the sort of early nineties. I went to Cardiff and, and I did uh, a postgraduate in fine art. So I've always oscillated between areas of applied art and fine art function over sort of uh, fine art. Can I take you just back? Yeah. Can I take you back a bit further to when you were nine. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a long time ago. When you were nine. And I think I'm right in you told me that your family were living in the Midlands. Yeah. Decided because of some family connections again to move to, to, to West. Yeah, my, I think it was classically. Um, it, it, this was the 1970s, and there was a whole back to the land sort of movement, and we had uh, cousins in Halford West, so we used to come on regular holidays, um, and then I sort of yeah the family sort of moved uh, at that sort of point and. We sort of, uh, I used to milk cows, two cows every day, and, um, and we sort of grew our own vegetables, and 
I do remember sort of uh, seeing um, uh, the, the guy who sort of was all, all the, the Seymours who um, they lived in Newport, which is not far from Cardigan. Uh, they wrote a, a book called Self Sufficiency, it was hugely influential in the 1970s, and in some degree was inf it, it, instrumental um, in sort of coming to West Wales. So we had cousins who also had a farm in, in outside Hafford West, and they sort of grew all their own vegetables. So we did the same sort of thing. And um, yeah, this sort of book I remember as a, as a, as a child sort of pouring over the sort of images of living self-sufficiency in, uh, in the, like the planting scheme of things. And uh, so we, we were self-sufficient in, in food, um, pretty much totally. So that book, and also Sally was a, um, a potter as well, so there's illustrations there about how to be a potter, so that sort of piqued my interest. But there's a nice circularity to this because um, I, I've also taught at Carmarthen uh, School of Art, and uh, there was a, a Rose Seymour, the granddaughter of, of this family, who are very influential. Um, so she got it signed by, uh, by Sally Seymour. Um, so there's a, it's a treasured sort of book, and in some respects, I think also, weirdly, it has some sort of connection with this exhibition in, in the sense that this, some of the pieces which we'll talk about in a little bit um, are made from this um, section where I did the research. So nothing bought, it's just completely self-sufficient. So I think there's a, probably a, some sort of interest there in terms of self well, it's like layers. The book, yeah. the book for you has got layers. It started off with me asking you about what illustrations could you, if you shut your eyes, almost mm. do because they were so influential as a child, as yeah. they are with most people. But actually it's got much more than that. There are many more layers to it, aren't there? Yeah. About yeah. the self-sufficiency element, but also the fact she was a potter and then to have the signature and everything at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. And it also makes me realise something that you said when we were speaking the other day, is that an awful, when you, you mentioned earlier that you went to Camberwell Art School, which had a fantastic reputation for ceramics, even when I was an art student mm. many years ago. Um, but also it's a classic thing that you said is often people from rural communities, they either stay there or they go away, mm -hmm. see bright lights, big city, blah, 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 mm. and then, they don't come back, mm. but you quite unusually did come back. Mm. So can you perhaps say now, what, what exactly drew you back? Because obviously I remember when you finished at Camberwell, you were starting to make a name. I remember there was an article mm. about you in Crafts Magazine. Yeah. You know, so you could have stayed, you could have stayed there, but you came back. Why did you come yeah. back? I think it's just, I'm very, I've always been, uh, maybe we do fall into categories of being rural people and uh, urban sort of people, but. I loved London, I loved my time there, and I loved the, the sort of, uh, it was, the art scene was very centred then, wasn't it? it you know, it's much more sort of regionalised now than it's probably ever been because of the internet. Uh, but I just really wanted to be, come home, you know, the sort of thing about, and it's a cliche, here I have you know, um, longing. So, um, and I'd established a connection with the gallery, so, you know, it was easier for me to set up a workshop in, in West Wales um, than that. Um, interesting, my, uh, my, my brother was sort of mo is moving house and he found an article about me in the Tyvee Side magazine. It was me with a terrible mullet and an awful jumper saying that when, when I sort of graduate, I want to set up a pottery in St. Ogmore's, which is, I'd completely forgotten about this. <laughs> <laughs> so that so was you, a, oh, you see, it's all come. It's it's you can't escape, you can't escape this, can you? Yeah, yeah. And actually, you saying for, for people that, the, although you're not Welsh, to actually understand hiraith, mm. longing. I mean, there isn't really, I mean, longing is quite a good word in English, but it's not quite the same as no, hiraith, is it? No, no. It's a yearning, uh, yeah. it's a very particular word, isn't it? Yeah. But for you, would I be right in thinking that a lot of that yearning and longing was A, you love the countryside, but also was the sea? Absolutely, a coastal sort of thing, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and not that I'd want to sort of um, particularly sort of get political, but. I, you know, under Norman Tebbit, sort of, um, you know, I'd, I'd support sort of Wales over, over sort of England, so although I'm born, born sort of an Englishman, then I'd, sort of, I'd hopefully, you know, die a Welshman. 
<laughs> well, so I've, I've lived here 46 years, and I should be dying an Englishwoman, <laughs> even though I live here. So <laughs> yeah. I'm obviously becoming, I'm obviously going mad, becoming Go terribly you. patriotic in a way which I never imagined I, yeah. I imagined I would. But no, you're a bit more imbued, even though I've lived yeah. here a very, very long time. So we've, our journey then, right now, our journey, kind of, we've gone from being nine, we have moved around, we, you went to Camberwell, which obviously you were very successful there, and then you went to Cardiff. What I think is interesting, which you mentioned to me the other day, which I hadn't appreciated, which makes me understand a bit more about some of your work that we'll talk about obviously now in a minute, is that when you went to Cardiff, you didn't do ceramics, did you? No, I didn't. No, I, I did sort of fine art and installation based sort of work. Um, and I think, as I said, I had this push-pull thing you know, within the British sort of art school system, British culture, it's been very divided in terms of you're a crass person, a designer for industry, or you're a fine artist. And I've always sort of reeled against, reeled against that, and I've moved between these sort of worlds, and I recognise they still exist. Mm. But thankfully, um, this day and age, um, you know, you might see ceramic in a fine art gallery. And some of the most interesting, for me, the most interesting um, areas of uh, of making or creativity are these sort of areas of fusion where you know you have it might be a functional object but it actually is sort of talking about lots of ideas and it's uh, sort of really a trigger like, like like conceptual art the object might be a trigger for for, for thinking other things so um, yeah I've always sort of uh, moved between this world so that was a very conscious effort to I want to go and be in the fine art world um, and which I did for a number of years afterwards. I sort of uh, worked with um, a group of other artists from, from Wales. We were called, uh, as a loose sort of group called Ointment, and we used to do socially engaged projects and work collaboratively. Um, but I think I got to a point, and I, my role within that group was very much about making functional objects, be it sort of carts or objects sure. to sort of uh, to facilitate projects. Um, it was very rural based. Um, but I, I, as I've got older, I think the sort of idea of function, and I know function is a very debatable point, that in a sense a piece of art is functional, because if we removed all the art in the world, I think we'd be, you know, as, as lockdown has proved, you know, um, how important art is to us in terms oh, of being music, say. poetry, you know, visual arts that, you know, and if we look at the, our penal system, they stick you in a cell, they don't put nice art in the cell because they want to sort of make your life impoverished because you've been naughty. So I understand that, you know, fine art is functional, but I've become, as I've got older, much more interested in the idea of uh, functional objects. But, and that's why when I asked you about um, a pretend desert island discs, hmm. but not discs, seven objects, yeah. uh, uh, fine art objects, applied art objects, any sort of objects, I think the list that you made yeah. absolutely reflects what you've just said. But also, what I think is rather nice is, I think I mentioned you, um, Roger Moss, my husband, who was the head of sculpture at the art school in Carmarthen uh, some years ago, he asked, who also taught you, he asked me to ask you, just out mm. of interest, what you would describe yourself as, because he'd been to see the exhibition. Yeah. And he was very delighted when you described yourself as... As a potter, yeah. As a potter. Yeah. Because so many people, don't they, go through these paroxysms of, you know, I'm a ceramic sculptor. They just can't bring themselves to use the word potter. But the yeah. fact that you did, and yet your work it covers all kinds of boundaries. You yeah. know, or rather, you've gone beyond all kinds of boundaries. And the fact you're really interested in fine art and you're very yeah. knowledgeable about fine art. You're not frightened of fine art. No, not at all, no. I mean, I describe myself as a potter, but... I use a fine art methodology in terms yes. of its to get to the point of its production, um, and I, it's a conscious thing to say a potter because built in within the art school system and also the culture there is a prejudice where in other cultures, say maybe in Japan or other parts of the world, there isn't this sort of hierarchy that um, fine art is seen as, as better and more intellectually in, engaging than, than a craft. So it, it is very much a conscious decision um, to, to say that. Which sort of actually almost um, d delightfully gives us an indication to now look at the exhibition mm. because there are elements and methodologies which do reflect the things that you've just described. Yeah. Whether it's the pots that actually look almost like... Um, in terms of colour and brushwork, 
like some of the painters, the contemporary or the 20th century painters that mm. you particularly like, or, or also, of course, where we're sitting and in another part of the exhibition, where there's, there's tea bowls mm. on shelves and here almost like little sake bottles and sake bowls mm. also sitting on shelves so you've got in the exhibition you've got an amazing number of references yeah so is it an, an opportunity now to look at something we discussed the other day which you quite liked is the fact that the, even the exhibition has got chapters in it yeah. elements so should we start by just talking about what we're sitting in front of which might be the best yeah. thing yeah i mean in a way i think it's talked the other day and I think chapters is a really good uh, way of explaining it and the genesis of, of, of the exhibition is uh, some research which I was uh, self-imposed, I, I work in a university as well part, partly um, and a part of that remit is doing research. So my research was about um, locate, what's called locational identity, how an object can evoke a sense of place. So I chose um, to take a very familiar bit of coastline, which is about 25 metres, and I set this particular parameter, and it's near Poppet Sands, uh, just to the left of Poppet Sands. And I collected, I studied that area, and uh, when, when I made that decision, even though it's very familiar, I became super excited about it. And I was excited that I was excited, in the <laughs> sense that literally hairs back, and I was crawling over the surface of it. Uh, it's a glacial melt, so there's different bands of clay, and if, when they fell off, I'd study them and I'd do firing experiments. Um, I'd look at the, the sort of intertidal area, so I'd be doing some uh, citizen science about the different types of seaweed. But I knew also seaweed was collected in North Wales and sent to Stoke-on-Trent as a sodium silicate. So um, I started doing experiments with, uh, with that, so literally the fabric of some of the material, these are ceramic um, shelves, I suppose, and they've got things like quartz, um, and the glazes are made up of, of some of the materials which have got seaweed ash in it, um, and iron oxide I collected. There's a little stream which ran, in, so I, with a paintbrush, collected the iron oxide. Mm -hmm. um, what preceded these ones is, is, in a sense, what I started with, which is um, out of shot, but uh, are some mugs. Uh, and they are purist, in a sense. Um, these are sort of a celebration of, of the geology, um, and it's an amazing sort of geology. I did a short geology course, um, still very much a beginner, but in terms of geological time, fascinating. You know, the, the, the sort of clay which arrived there from basically North Wales coming down the Irish Sea, and various glacial sort of melts, and then the huge sort of volcanic pushing up of, of, of the sort of Earth's crust and creating these amazing sort of swirls. And so that was, that was one sort of element of inquiry. And I think when I say I have a fine art methodology in, in production of making sort of pots and functional things, it, um, one of the great things about being an artist is that you can roam into any field. <laughs> so we, you know, within our human sort of um, being inquisitive about science or whatever, they have their own methodologies. But if you're a sort of an artist, you can go and play with anybody's methodology. <laughs> um, so play from playing with geology um, was was it? And and the first chapter, I suppose, in this was was making some functional mugs. Um, so I studied the different types of clays. Um, and Poppet is, a, I mean, it's not a sort of a Welsh name in one sort of sense. I mean, obviously, Trith is Beach in Welsh, and it has been known as Trith Gwyn. Um, but um, the medieval monks of St. Ogmores, uh, this is a local historian, uh, believes that uh, it might mean Pot Pit. So that really interested me, and that's what partly the selection, because there's a medieval fish trap there, and I thought, well, maybe these guys were sitting there waiting for the tide to change going, oh, this clay's good. And then, <laughs> you, you old romantic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they go, oh, okay, instead of digging a big hole, we can take this clay, put it on the boat sure, sure. with the fish and take it back up. <laughs> so there was that sort of level of, like you have geological time, you have historical time. So I started collecting these sorts of things and then thinking, well, to make a glaze flux is quite, quite difficult. So I tried different clays with lots of iron oxide and then I ball milled it to make it sort of flux more and then I needed more flux, so that was where the seaweed came in. Uh, and I crushed up rock. So, and I collected bits of plastic. Part of the other sort of thing was as a dual purpose to the research was I wanted to 
David Attenborough's fantastic sort of um, polemic about sort of how, how we're sort of polluting the, the sea. So I'd beach clean, so I'd gather huge amounts of, sort of plastic and you know, things, you know, I've, got, I've got some objects here which I'm sure you can see the visual reference yes, with, yes, with yes. that. And, uh, this, this is sort of features in the exhibition over, over there which I made a mould of that and it's beautifully uh, scarred by the sea. So I started to collect... And that's, sorry that. to interrupt you, but that's very much reflected that sort of initial interest in the mugs because yeah. whilst you're, you're looking at you know, the, the making glazes and the different clay, every handle on the mugs is, is actually cast from something that's yeah. plastic. Yeah. The only difference, of course, with the other work in the exhibition where you pick up on that is the fact that they're not um, highly coloured like a lot, of the, lot of the plastic. Yeah, yeah. But you also said, I thought, a really interesting thing on the phone the other day, and that was that you're collecting... Um, I've got an artist at home who's just like you. We've also got shedfuls and roomfuls of yeah, plastic yeah. And, and bits of rope and everything exactly like you yeah. um, but it's about enjoying looking isn't it and oh, discovering yeah, yeah, yeah. but but also it's it's um as you said it's like that dichotomy between beauty and destruction yeah all this fantastically interesting material yeah. it's like you said about the the attenborough element to it yeah. and that's quite a that's quite a curious you're, in a way, you're making, you're, you're intrigued by the objects that you yeah. see because of the colour, the shape, etc., et and how they get broken down in different ways. Yeah. And you're using them to your own ends. I am. I mean, in a way, sort of, it, they're really horrible things because they're creating microplastics and they're kind of being ingested by everything. So there's that element. Um, but also, I get really excited. Like, this, this fella here is, um, <laughs> is a walrus. And I was so excited when I, you know, well, actually my wife found, found him, but um, Ellie, and uh, it's such a beautiful object, but then it's, he's so revolting as well, you know, yes. sort of starting to come apart, and, and the irony in that, and that. so, um, yeah, so from, you know, th that was the first chapter really was, was a scientific, pseudo-scientific study of materiality of, of the things which I sort of um, investigating, but also the narratives of these objects which, you know, they arrive on this sort of beach, you know. And so is there, I mean, looking at, around the exhibition, is there actually, I haven't quite appreciated this actually until we're talking now, a, 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 a sequence of events almost that started with the mugs? Yeah. Ish, ish, yeah. ish. And then what did you go on to next? Because there's something far more considered and... Um, um, Viable. No, that sounds yeah. dreadful. Yeah, no. And I mean, we should actually make sure that people understand that everything in the exhibition, apart from the mugs, is for sale. Is for sale. Yeah, yeah. I, I felt that I couldn't sort of sell the mugs, it, partly because the sensitivity that I don't want to be a contributor to coastal erosion. So I literally, like a windfall fruitarian, I'd get excited when a bit fell off. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> because I could feel I could pick that up. Um, and I don't want to sort of promote people to go no, and no. do that. Of course um, not. But, you know, it was, it was for a scientific sort of, um, pseudoscientific sort of reason. But what happened next was I would start collecting these objects and, um, and then quite freely making bucket forms. So, you know, sometimes you get plastic containers, literally physical buckets, a lot of fishing material. So I allowed myself... And you know, I really thank Aura Merlin for this because it drove my practice on in a way to make more um, sculptural um, vessels. And they are less specific in a sense that they're an amalgam of, of a patination of something which has been washed up or a physical form or, or a piece of mesh, you know, um, like a fishing creel or something sure. like that. So, that sort of came next, and then what came after that were actually maybe towards the end uh, were these, and also some the bowls. Um, and so the, you really have got a kind of it's like we said before about the chapters. Yeah. The bowls that you're just going to go on to now. Yeah. So you've got your, you've got the bowls. You've got those that very early experimentation with the with the mugs. Yeah. Which then have kind of. And I know you're experimenting all the time. I'm not suggesting yeah. it's quite as cut and dried as that. Yeah. But it's almost as if before you get onto the bowls as well, you've got these individual objects. I'm looking at the four that are over here, yeah. which have references, of course, to 20th century painting as well. You know, so there's, yeah. there's a lots of things for people to look at and discover. 
yeah, when I they mean, come to the exhibition, isn't yeah, there? There really I mean, is. Uh, one of the sort of um, things which I'd, I'd hope really is it, it, it would stimulate people to go on, on a journey in, it, in a sense of what the reference was. And when you ask me, you know, what, you know, can you sort of name seven artists which were really influential? That was quite a tough sort of gig, but, uh, but in a way, people like uh, Roger Hilton, 20th century uh, painter, um, I didn't actually have him on my list. He was on my list, but then sort of, I had to sort of, because I only could have seven, like people like Cy <laughs> How mean. You know, uh, yeah, so there is a sort of a, a 20th century, um, I suppose mainly from St. Ives, you know, you know that, that, sort of, that sort of era, very, you know, Ben Nicholson, and, that, that sort of uh, is, is influential in that sort of sense. Um, the other people on your list, and I haven't forgotten, I'm sorry, I interrupted you yeah. when you were talking about the, about to talk about the bowls, but just go back to the list and yeah. we'll come back to the bowls, is that on your list that you said, um, I think I mentioned to you before, I think there were at least four on the list that I wasn't personally, wasn't familiar yeah. with, and I thought that was really interesting, so I'm yeah. going to make a note, I'm going to find out about them. Yeah, Theos Gates, I think, is sort of, I came across, he was in the Artist Monday in Cardiff, never heard of him before, um, and you can Google him on, on the, he's a black American artist, and you can Google him on, he's on TED Talks and things like that, amazing inspiration, but I felt a kindred spirit for him because he started as a potter, um, but he does socially engaged projects, um, hugely ambitious in, in his sort of, in his practice and uh, really interesting. Uh, and then, yeah, so when I sort of say on my list, you know, you have, for me, uh, a medieval jug, which is not a specific jug necessarily, but I love going to St. Fagans, you know, any opportunity to go <laughs> to St. Fagans. I just love sort of being in, in those environments and being in those houses, all the different areas. But, I've always been super excited by medieval sort of pottery and that space before industrialization really takes hold, if you like, that where the, you know, the local potters were responding to the local materials and how that jug looks similar to the house in some sort of way sure. because the house is hewn out of the material from the ground. So that they would be on, on my list. Um, and as I said, people like sort of, uh, Roger Hilton although not a particularly nice individual, he used to hit his students. He was oh, an no. alcoholic and hit his students with <coughs> his walking stick if they hadn't done enough work. Oh, my goodness um, me. Yeah. But, um, Perhaps you shouldn't have had him on your list. Well, that's the thing. You know, do, do you edit artists out because they weren't very nice? You know, Picasso wasn't very nice to women. You know, do, you get, do you edit him out? You know, so that's an interesting another debate. Really. <laughs> um, but then people like uh, Francois Elise, who's a Belgian artist, uh, lives, has been living in South America, um, and he, he like the Asta Gates, uh, multidisciplinary in, in their sort of uh, in their sort of practice, um, and very current. Who I've only just discovered uh, an international group of artists called Future Farmers, who I've always loved farming and the relationship of art and farming. So they really sort of exciting me at the moment, um, and uh, they're looking at sort of a whole sort of global environmental issues as, and, and then integrating that art. So Do you think you could, you could add the list onto your website yeah, or your blog? Yeah, I'll do it on sort of People can have a bit of a butcher's, yeah. which is why I feel we should go back to your bowls, I'm terribly sorry, yeah. is it's, when I read your dissertation, Right. Um, I, gosh, I learned a lot from that. I mean, I, I, what are the late, what are the, what, the uh, Isle of Lewis? Yeah, Atelier yeah. NL, so it's yes. uh, Nadine and... Yes, and, and the, I, I, I wasn't aware of, the, of yeah. the, 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 them. And the reason that was interesting for me was because it underpins what you've said about utilitarian and it c can go into something else. Yeah, yeah, but the research which preceded this research, if you, if you like, was, it was I interviewed two uh, Dutch uh, designers um, Atelier NL, and I went to Eindhoven. So they are avant-garde designers, um, and um, they sort of are sort of on the on the edge of what might be considered fine art and, and design. As I said, that's a very interesting space for for me. I really find that really exciting. And again, reels against the sort of prejudice, you know, this sort of hierarchy within the British context that you know fine art is far more intellectually engaging. Well, no, actually, there are people who in the design world who are as intellectually um, 
engaged as well. Sure. So, yeah, so the, the, the bowl, coming back to the, the bowls, it, they sort of came midway through, if you like, this sort of journey of, of research. And uh, I, I sort of have a, a pottery, um, which is the smallest shop in Wales, but it's the front part of my, my sort of pottery in, in St. Arnold's. Um, and that is sort of functional where, you know, it's not sort of like a 1970s potter where you know I could produce you know well I could if you know a whole dinner set. It's it's more sort of individual things like you know jugs or bowls or plates or drinking sort of vessels. Um, and for me, the the bowls which are brushed on the outside with elements of clay, I've I've gathered. Uh, the insides are more of a painterly sort of reference to. That experience of swimming in the sea or being on the edge of the sea. Well, they're a little bit like looking into little rock pools, rock I pools, think, some yeah, of them. Yeah, they're, they're lovely. Yeah. Stones and things like that. I mean, I, I, I sort of always love Brendan Stuart Burns' sort of work, and I work with Brendan as well. So, yeah, they are sort of, I suppose, out of all the different sort of chapters, uh, quite a, a direct link between being functional things, which salad bowls or beakers you oh. can tr drink out of, but they are very much drawn from, from that sense of place, really. You saying about Brendan Burns, apart from his paintings, which are very much about looking, his photographs of rock pools are absolutely wonderful, which, right. which reminds me to, to say about the fantastic video that's also in the exhibition. So you've got another chapter, yeah, yeah. which is by your friend Nigel Goldsmith, which is one, and wonderful. So it really yeah. complements, it's a kind of additional element. Yeah. And it links in with that idea of you know looking into the rock pool yeah. and going actually going inside it of course. Yeah, I mean on on sort of the gallery, one of the sort of galleries at Walls is is a video um, produced by, by by Nigel and he he went to Cardigan School as well. He he was sort of born in sort of in, in Cardigan and but he lives in Bath where where I work a couple of days a week, three days a week, and um, I take him rubbish. <laughs> which is why it wasn't very funny. I was I'm going to say, but she was thrilled. <laughs> I arrived with a bag of rubbish and said, Nigel, what do you want to do with it? So he's produced this video of, of, of this sort of rubbish um, in this sort of abstract sort of way. Uh, but also he's uh, on the gallery wall of three Instagram sites. So um, there's one which is sort of Nigel's own sort of site, Nigel Goldsmith on Instagram, and one is St Dogmas Pottery. Um, and the other one is Neptune's bin bag. Uh, Neptune's bin bag um, is a sort of, it, are objects which I've collected and taken to Nigel. And so I've made, uh, it started as a, as a sort of, to stimulate students actually, I, I work with to, to make sculpture um, out of rubbish or things around the house, because sure. during lockdown, it's a, it's a <laughs> lockdown project, uh, Neptune's bin bag, but it became really, um, hugely influential in the sense that I'd place an object next to another object, a bit of fishing twine or whatever, and I wouldn't, and then I'd photograph it, and I thought, well, actually, and that's what stimulated right. a, a lot of, you know, the sort of, some of the objects um, which are in, in the exhibition, like the more mesh orientated ones, and also on the wall, on, on the wall over there, there's a sort of, um, like fishing mesh with a shelf and a and a coffee bowl on top of it. Actually, just reminds me actually to ask you about those particular ones, which is another chapter. This is a one with almost with like little beautiful little tea bowls. Mm. Why did you decide to do the mesh in ceramic? Why didn't you just use mesh that you'd gathered? Why uh, did you make the mesh just out of interest? Yeah, I mean, it, it's obviously when uh, one of the things, thought processes, creative processes, I was thinking about. I could bring these physical plastic objects which have inspired it. Um, I don't know, but I felt it didn't feel right. Okay. Um, and also <laughs> from a material exploration, so that one of the things about clay, it's hugely versatile, as you know. Um, and I've got an extruder. So these ah, are extruded. Right. And when you actually extrude, you have this tube of clay coming out. It's really exciting. And then sometimes they drop on the floor. And then I had this bit of a thing where it dropped on the floor. And I thought, oh, that looks, looks like that <laughs> bit of mesh which I picked up. So one of the things that, you know, yes, there's a fine art methodology, but also there's a material investigation in terms of clay to certain things under certain conditions. So that's why that they came about. Well, I would say that is a perfect answer. In every way. <laughs> I'm, I'm very mindful. We've looked at it, we've sort of glimpsed, we've had a bit of a glimpse, haven't we, at each of the chapters. But yeah. I'm also very mindful that 
we agreed when we chatted the other day that there were some things that you wanted to make sure that we t that you said yeah so i'm just going to get the list yeah, just, to, just, just, yeah, just to remember yeah. so yeah. firstly was the mugs where well, we've talked about the mugs yeah. um oh actually the other thing which you've sort of mentioned when you were saying about lockdown and doing stuff with the students um which was about how objects gather worlds around them that was yeah. one of the things you thought was really important. In fact, you've actually articulated that really nicely, talking yeah. about, you know, for you, it's objects that you collect to pop at sands or yeah. elsewhere, but you've encouraged the students to do it around the house in lockdown, so. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I th I, out of recollection, I think it's a term from Wittgenstein, but I'm very interested in, in theory in terms of phenomenology and um, Merleau-Ponty sort of ideas and, you know, you can take them, I mean, you know, you've worked in museums for years, that sort of it, a very humble object um, related to its provenance can stimulate mm -hmm. a huge amount Absolutely. of inquiry. And that's always really fascinated me. And uh, I suppose it's an aspiration uh, for the work in a way, or an ambition for the work that, yes, hopefully, you know, the pleasing way in terms of how I've created the surfaces on, on the forms, but, um, I would hope that it might inquire, you know, encourage people to be beach cleaners, to make sculpture out of rubbish, yeah. to, to do those sorts of things. But generally, I think that's really important. And also, in a way, point. you're making your own, by gathering those things, you're making your own stories, aren't you? They all had their own story, but yeah. you're actually making. The, another thing which we said we mustn't forget, which actually we have said, is the fact that you're a potter, yeah. but you're also a visual artist, yeah. with an, obviously an interest in fine art. We'd, we said that we should mention about beauty and disgust. Well, we've sort of talked about that, haven't yeah. we? You've said about your Instagram, Neptune bin bags. I'm yeah. going to say it again because I think it's brilliant. Yeah, I have to claim my, my, my Ellie, my wife, that came up with that. She's really good at, well, uh, good. Uh, good at naming her. things. Well, good. Good for Wives, of course, are terribly important to artists. <laughs> Oh, terribly she's terribly my, important. Uh, so she's, she's, my t she's as great as having a critic on hand as well. <laughs> <laughs> she's quite a good critic. And I suppose the other thing, really, to to say, if, if perhaps, I, I'm quite sure we ought to perhaps wind, wind up now, is that um, we want, don't, when I say we, I mean the gallery, the gallery staff, and obviously you, the yeah. artist, and Nigel, want people to come and see the exhibition because the gallery is now open. Yes. So it's, it's no longer in lockdown. Yeah. And yeah. to come and discover and yeah. be intrigued yeah. for yeah. themselves. So hopefully, I think everything that you've talked about um, and unexpected things like your, you know, like your seven desert island discs in inverted commas yeah. and also of course the Seymour's book and your own interest in looking at the world is should I use the word inspiring yes I will so thank you I think yeah. the anticipation and the hope is that people will come and see and enjoy yeah it's on to the 24th of October yes. and yeah I'm the first person after lockdown for, for the gallery so feel quite honoured about that and also I've had some really nice feedback on how people, Good. how much they've missed going, going to a gallery. Good. So hopefully Well I think you're a perfect person to be you. the one in lockdown yeah. because of everything that you do and I can honestly say to you, you look no different now that you're 50 shortly than you did when you were 16. <laughs> <laughs> it's Thank been you. such a pleasure and I can't hug you or shake your hand yeah. but just to say it's been a real pleasure to be reintroduced after all these years. Thank you so much. Great. Been thank to you. Meet you. Well, thank you for the exhibition. Thank you. And thank you.